Hello, this is Dr. Turkmani, and this uh, presentation is about uh, thin manual DSEC. Is manual dissection as good as automated? Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizer, uh, organizers for the invitation, and I have no financial interest to disclose relevant to this talk. As a brief introduction, endothelial keratoplasties are nowadays the treatment of choice for endothelial disorders because they are safer and faster, uh, faster recovery than that of a PKP for the same conditions. It initially started in the form of DLEC or PLK, however there were significant interface problems. The technique was somehow abandoned for a little while till uh, DSEC and its automated uh, counterpart were developed. It later on evolved into ultra-thin uh, DSEC or DSEC and the final iteration of endothelial transplantation is now uh, DMEC. Uh, in which only endothelium and decimates membrane is transplanted. However, I would like to say that my technique of choice for any endothelial disorder still today for me is thin manual DSEC. In terms of uh, preoperative considerations, uh, there is a full assessment of the eye needed and of course paying extra, uh, extra attention on the cornea. We need to look at the condition of the endothelium how diseased it is and we need to look at the presence or absence of stromal scars because traditional stromal scarring has been considered a contraindication for endothelial keratoplasty. We'll touch briefly into this topic later. And also says presence or absence or other, uh, of other ocular comorbidities, whether the patient is phakic, aphakic, pseudophakic or is there an anterior chamber eye well, uh, whether the patient has intraocular pressure problems, whether the patient has an appropriate iris scaffold for surgery, whether there is corneal neovascularization, and whether there has been um, uh, any, any previous corneal grafts or any previous ocular surgery. Indications of, uh, as we've just uh, mentioned, any endothelial disorder is amenable for endothelial keratoplasty. Mainly, the, the main indications are fuchs dystrophy and pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, but any other endothelial disorder can be a candidate for endothelial keratoplasty and also uh, it can be performed for tectonic reasons. In terms of contraindications, a patient with healthy endothelium should not benefit from an endothelial keratoplasty. Central corneal scarring, I put the question mark because uh, when a patient presents with corneal scarring, or sorry, with, with a corneal opacity in a very decompensated cornea and concomitant scarring, sometimes it's not that easy to differentiate whether the opacity is mostly related to edema or mostly related to scarring. And, and, and there may be a good case for that patient to have a DSEC and when the edema is resolved, if the amount of residual corneal scarring was significant, then that patient can be uh, a good candidate for a dull cover DSEC. We will go into this topic later. And then patients with unresponsive glaucoma are not very likely to benefit from an endothelial keratoplasty. In terms of the surgical technique, it consists on replacing the host decimate and endothelium with a donor lamella that consists of a thin, uh, thin slice of stroma plus decimates plus endothelium. Donor preparation, uh, what I do is I soak the donor cornea in BSS for 30 minutes to swell it up and that would work for two main purposes. Number one, it makes the dissection of the corneal lamellae easier and number two, if you get on the table a lamella of let's say 150 microns of cornea that has been soaked in BSS, when that lamella is implanted in the eye of the patient and the endothelium starts to pump, by definition it's going to be even thinner. So in other words, you can get thinner donor lamellae by soaking the donor cornea in BSS. Then the donor cornea is mounted in an artificial interior chamber which is filled in with air because the air endothelium interface facilitates um, the, the visualization of the depth of our dissection. Then I do an incision at limbus with a guarded diamond blade at 500 microns depth and I do the manual dissection with a Murlet spatula. When I punch the donor 
uh, graft, then I do an F stamp on the stromal side, and then I load the graft into the injector. These stills just show uh, the dissection technique. On the left hand side, the cornea has been mounted in the artificial AC, air has been placed uh, inside the artificial AC, and then in the picture in the middle and right hand side, you can see that reflection at the end of the tip of my dissector. So basically the distance from the tip of your dissector and that reflection line is the distance of the tip of your dissector from the endothelium. Then you are in control of the dissection at every single moment and you know how deep you are in order to avoid perforation of the donor graft material. Surgical technique in the eye of the patient I do usually, for most of cases, a marking with a 9mm ring, then I do a paracentesis through which I use the Simque cannula that I control with the foot pedal of the FACO machine for the infusion line and my main incision is 4.5mm, initially I only open it to 2.2mm for the decimetorexis and then prior to insertion of the injector I enlarge it to 4.5mm. I strip 9 millimeters of host decimates membrane with a Y-shaped dialer and then I inject float and center the graft, suture the main wound with a cross stitch tenon nylon and then inject subconjunctival kefroxim and dexamethasone. So what are the advantages of uh, thin manual DSEC over uh, DMEC or PDEC? Um, in my experience I think it is far more forgiving in complex cases, it is far more forgiving in case there is blood or fever in the anterior chamber. It can serve for tectonic purposes and it can also serve for uh, a scaffold, uh, as a scaffold for a subsequent dial procedure. These slides are of a case, a complex case, patient that had several failed penetrating keratoplasties, uh, complicated cataract surgery with vitreous prolapse, and a glaucoma tube and presents to me with a decompensated failed graft. I started by doing anterior vitrectomy, then I continued with my routine technique, stripping of decimates membrane, insertion floating centering of the graft, and uh, finally uh, suturing the main port. And in this case, I also sutured the side ports. And you can see in the picture bottom right, a graft which is well positioned despite of all the challenges with vitreous in anterior chamber, glaucoma tube, etc. etc. This is another case that was referred to me with several failed previous DSECs and a glaucoma tube. So again, I mark with the 9mm ring for pro presentation of the new DSEC graft in the right top picture you can see how I am stripping the old failed DSEC then the bottom pictures is me inserting and unfolding the graft floating and centering into the appropriate position and this is the picture of the eye a few weeks after with significant visual recovery and a much clearer cornea. As I've mentioned, it can, it, it can also serve for tectonic purposes. You can see this case in which there was a corneal perforation with a hypotonic eye due to herpes virus. So I performed a tectonic DSEC. You can see how well this is plugging the perforation in the right top uh, picture. The picture in the middle is the OCT of the cornea a few weeks after. You start seeing epithelial filling of the defect of the perforation and then a few months after it's the bottom uh, OCT scan with a much further filling of the stromal defect with epithelium and a properly attached DSEC providing with good tectonic support. This other case is a patient that had a failed PKP for keratoconus and presented to me with a failed graft as well as corneal scarring from a ruptured bullet that later on developed a corneal ulcer. When he presented to me there was a very significant corneal cloud and I wasn't sure how much of that was just edema and how much of that was due to scarring. I offered the patient the possibility of going straight away for a 
penetrating keratoplasty, but he had a toric lens uh, f after he had cataract removed, and he was aware of the fact that doing a new PKP would change the astigmatism and therefore invalidate the effect of the toric lens. So he was keen on trying a DSEC, which I did successfully for him. However, when it resolved the edema and unmasked the residual scarring, that was quite significant with not much of visual improvement. So I performed later on a subsequent DALC over DSEC. This picture was one day after the DALC. I've highlighted with the blue arrow the edges of the underlying DSEC and with the red arrow the edges of the overlying DALC. You see how clear it was just on day one, still the air bubble in the interior chamber and how this DSEC graft served for uh, served as a scaffold for the subsequent DALC. In terms of outcomes, Thilman DSEC is comparable to other DSEC techniques in terms of complication rate and graft survival rate. It is also comparable in terms of visual recovery. The only one advantage of DSEC compared to DSEC in terms of visual recovery is that with DSEC, Visual recovery is quicker because the stromal interface is m smoother. In manual DSEC it's a bit more rough and that accounts for a slightly more delayed visual recovery compared to DSEC. Nonetheless, in all other respects it's comparable to DSEC. The mean graft thickness of my sample of cases when I was doing my fellowship was approximately around 100 microns for the reasons described. We soak the fluid to make it thicker so when the endothelium starts pumping it will thin as it de-swells. Mean dissection time, time was around 7 minutes. Perforation rate well, was around 3.45% but I would like to highlight that the perforation rate was comparable to that of other techniques bearing in mind that this was during my learning curve as a fellow, so comparatively there could be a point in saying that this technique is safer because the perforation rate done this way was comparable to the perforation rate of other DSEC techniques, which most of them were reports of highly experienced surgeons uh, performing the surgery. And that would be one of the advantages of being able to see the depth of your dissection uh, by filling in the artificial anterior chamber with air instead of fluid. Rate of uh, postoperative graft detachment was again comparable to that of other techniques. I also had in my sample of cases one upside down graft, which that was before I was marking the grafts with the F stamp, but this complication has not happened again since I started marking all the graphs with an F stamp in the stromal side. And uh, prime failure rate, again, comparable to uh, other DSEC techniques. I've put uh, at the bottom of this slide the references of our three papers on thin manual DSEC uh, for anyone who wants to have further information on this technique. And finally, as a summary, thin manual DSEC is a robust, reproducible, reliable technique, even in challenging cases. It is definitely safer than a PKP. Uh, compared to DMEC, perhaps final visual outcome is a bit less. However, um, visual recovery is quite significant with the appropriate technique. Uh, recovery is reasonably quick. It is more forgiven in cases with a disrupted anterior segment, with failed PKPs, with the anterior chamber, AFAQ cases, anterior chamber IOLs, etc. Uh, the stroma stroma interface accounts for a slightly worse final visual acuity compared to that of DMEC. Nonetheless, as I've just said, usually when these patients present to you, they have a lower visual acuity than that they get after surgery or they are very symptomatic with glare, halos, etc. from variable corneal edema throughout the day and they report a visual improvement in quantity and quality of vision after surgery.
It is important to identify the risk factor for graft failure and do an appropriate patient selection and, of course, monitor for any post-operative issues, in other words, lifelong surveillance. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and, once again, thanks to the organizers for the invitation.